Hello and welcome to TechCrunch TV. My name is Alex and I'm joined today, actually, well, we're your office, not my office. But I'm here with the CEO of App Annie. Now, before we start, he has a beautiful name, so I'm going to let him say it because I will butcher it. So, go. My name is Bertrand Schmidt. Exactly. And that's why I didn't say it. Now, let's get into this. Uh, it's GDC week. GDC is a big conference about games, mobile games, and um, kind of mobile games that are making a lot of money. So, let's break that into, into revenue here because some games charge upfront, some games don't and then charge you in-app, and some games use advertising. What are you seeing in the industry right now in terms of how games are making money? So yeah, so that's GDC week, and, uh, and GDC is becoming more and more about mobile. Uh, in terms of what's making money in mobile, as you say, there are three business models, and the one working the best at this stage is really in-app purchase. So you start with a free game, but people can do some in-app purchase, buy stuff inside the game, and step by step, your game moves from making no money because it's free to making money the more people use the app. And that's becoming a more popular business model for the entire industry. People are doing this more often than they used to. As in, people are charging less up front and then more in-app. Yes, okay. yes. I, I mean, it has been very popular to democratize, I would say, the, uh, the app industry in terms of making a good business model. I mean, before then, paid apps work a bit with iOS. It still work in some occasion. But in terms of monetization, uh, freemium within a purchase has really been the way to go. So in like, say, two years, are we going to see 90% freemium games, do you think? Uh, I think we are already on 90%. Oh, OK. <laughs> so does this, does this trend to zero then? I mean, will it be So, so the trend uh, has moved pretty fast in the last two years. Huh? I think it has been, I mean, now we are at 90%. Again, I think there are some, some good exceptions. Uh, some games that make sense to be monetized more upfront that provides a different uh, experience. We see a lot uh, of games coming from console that are being adapted and ported to mobile. And they want to keep the logic of you have this premium pricing. Mm -hmm. And they don't want also to change all the game because usually you, you can't just change the pricing. You I need see. to change the game to take advantage oh, of so the Oh, so the game mechanics the themselves have to change. Does that lead, to, like, to, a, does game that game lead to worse apps and worse games if the in-app experience is just designed about extracting revenue from the user? Of course. Uh, I would just say that uh, game company learns what are the, the best practice, the worst practice. And step by step, I mean, you, you won't be successful getting a lot of downloads, a lot of traction and monetizing if your business model is horrible for the user. So, well, so you end that's up, not you always true. Because Flappy Bird had a terrible user experience, and it was very popular. I'm kidding. The game is just very hard to play. <laughs> um, it was said that the game was making $50,000 a day in advertising revenue. Mm -hmm, do you think mm -hmm. that's a reasonable, do you think that's right? Yes, yeah, so I think Flappy Bird is a, a good example of a game not monetizing through in-app purchase, but through advertisement. And definitely, you have a, a few like this. It's pretty tough to really make money in that business model, except if you get millions of downloads. Mm. Uh, and that's what happened with Flappy Bird, is that they got f millions of downloads. And on top of it, apparently, they didn't spend much money to get these downloads. And that's what I wanted to ask you next, because there were some allegations that these charts were impossible, that it was too viral, that it moved too quickly, that some of the reviews were fake. Now, your company spends a lot of time digging into the actual raw numbers of the app industry, so you have a pretty good conception of this. Do you think there was any kind of um, messy business in its rise? Uh, it's difficult to say. I, I was surprised by some of the reviews initially, but then apparently a lot of people just created this you know, more and more crazy reviews, making fun of the game itself. So yeah. my first reaction was, oh, this looks fake. And second after was, no, actually, maybe there's just some crazy phenomenon. People just make fun of, of this. So, it's not clear for me to, to really know what happens. What we know is that they got huge success in terms of downloads. The, downloads. the downloads are real. And the reviews definitely became, I mean, just like more of a, a phenomenon. Did you play the game? Yeah, I played it. What was your high score? I won't give my score because I was not so good. I can just say that <laughs> at Apani, we got people who ended up to 72. 72? I got to 4. Uh, and, and I, and they were machines, <laughs> kicking. I'm very glad your employees are so good at play Flappy Bird, by the way. That's <laughs> going to drive top line. Exactly, exactly. I was very, very proud to see that. So outside, outside the games part of, of, of apps, which you know, is the most popular segment, uh, what category of apps are you seeing kind of like coming up in popularity or maybe coming up in terms of revenue? Like, what's next? So that's a, that's a good question. Definitely, last year has been the year of messaging. And you have, you have, we have all heard about the big acquisition, huh? uh, WhatsApp, yeah. Viber a few weeks before, uh, uh, acquired by Rakuten in Japan for, I mean, still a big sum, only right. a billion dollars. And then, of course, uh, $19 billion acquisition of WhatsApp, mostly equity. 
But uh, for me, it's a proof that yeah, it's a big, it's a big, big market. Uh, people use uh, these apps a lot. It has replaced uh, traditional SMS. Do you think they have a lot of room to still grow? Do you think these apps have a lot of like in terms of total user base? Usually, most of these apps are very competitive, so they are a bit more like you are not on three different social networks or so messaging apps at the right. same time. So I think usually you're on one, and after that, the rest doesn't work. So uh, uh, I think there is a, a limit, and each market can support one big player. So it's who can go first and take ownership of these markets, and after that, life is miserable for other players, basically. So I think East Asia has been a very special market with very local players. The rest of Asia has seen a lot of competition coming mostly from these players. And again, Western Europe, as well as uh, US, has been WhatsApp market. Uh, and I mean, so this is not just. Let's not forget Skype, sorry. No, that's, so that's Skype true. Skype has actually been uh, doing quite well in all of this. But this, we actually see this in another example because Path is very popular in Indonesia. I've checked the charts 100 times and not very popular in other places. So do you think we're going to see this? Do you think it's going to stay this way? That apps will stay almost country based if they're messaging? I think it's. You, you have, again, you have. So, social is, works very well inside one country. It's not because you are successful in one that you can adapt so easily your, your model to another one. You might have been successful for random reason. Mm -hmm. Local celebrities who started using it and people heard about it and suddenly it exploded, that you cannot replicate as easily in some other markets. So one last question. What is your favorite app that you use now? That's a very good question. Uh, a lot of apps I, I use regularly. Evernote, mm -hmm. uh, Wonderlist, uh, so really productivity type of app, Skype. I'm using a lot. I'm using WeChat a lot. So some of these apps. So Skype yes, and WeChat. Yes, yes. WeChat for messaging. I mean, one thing is that Skype has been good on voice over IP and video, mm -hmm. not so good on pure messaging. It takes time to receive your message. Right. They, they recently made some improvement, actually, realizing that, yeah, messaging is not a nice add-on to voice. It can be central to the experience. Right. So they are moving in that direction. But right now, the two are separate. Well, as a writer, I'm glad to hear that. And uh, thanks for talking to us. Thank you, Alex. Glad to be here.